طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رمضان مبارك علينا وعليكم ان شاء الله وكل عام وانتم بخير رمضان مبارك for everyone رب يتقبل صيامكم وقيامكم um, thank you guys for being here in this lovely wonderful night in Ramadan um, I would like to first uh, thank MESPO for giving us this um, opportunity to participate uh, with the uh, organization uh, with our uh, field and what we really what we're really passionate about um, the three of us uh, work uh, in the cochlear implant and hearing aids unit at King Abdelaziz University in Jeddah Saudi Arabia and um, we're here to talk about a very important topic uh, which is um, the uh, uh, diagnosing and assessing children with hearing loss um, I would like to also thank event troop for uh, uh, organizing this event with MESPO uh, it's really a um, a wonderful experience so far with uh, with the company and uh, what they work with what they're doing with uh, with us. Um, we have today um, experts in this field, people that are really passionate about caring for children with uh, hearing disability and improving their care. Uh, we have Dr. Sara Sebai. Dr. Sara Sebai is an audiovestibular medicine specialist. Uh, she really has um, passion and dedicated her. Uh, research and care for advancing the early detection programs and advancing diagnosing children uh, with hearing loss and improving their quality of life, understanding how they feel and how they um, they can suffer from that. Uh, she has really pioneered um, this field and really are pushing forward the input of that. Thank you, Dr. Sara, for being with us. Uh, we also have Dr. Mohammed Naaman. Dr. Mohammed Naaman is our lead uh, audiologist in the cochlear implant program, and he's an, uh, an expert audio, audio vestibular medicine specialist who really is um, passionate and uh, has uh, mastered uh, the uh, the art of uh, auditory rehabilitation for children with hearing loss, especially those who need cochlear implantation and different implantable hearing devices. My name is Faisal Zawawi. Uh, I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist. Uh, um, I work mostly with children with hearing disabilities, and I'm really passionate about uh, advancing the care for these children. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, and thank you, Dr. Sara, uh, for being here. Uh, and um, let's start our talk. So this is really a casual conversation. Uh, we did not. Uh, it's not a. Uh, PowerPoint presentation or any slides. This is really what we work. This is how we work on day-to-day -day basis. This is how we uh, interact with each other and trying to discuss issues. So why is this an important issue? So the importance of um, this problem is that we have to understand why it is important for children to hear early. Uh, the reason behind that, because this is a critical period for children to develop their speech and language. It's also a very important time for children, the younger they are, is they have a better ability to absorb uh, uh, the language that is spoken around them. And this is really important, so it makes it very important for us to detect their issues early and be able to intervene when necessary. And it's also an important period for the for these children to have um, an understanding Oh, for the parents, I've been telling you that the hearing loss can affect speech because it can cause speech delay. It also can affect communication skills, but not only that, down the line, it can affect their academic performance, social interaction, and also emotional developments. And that's why early detection is very important for these patients and children and families. Um, we have to understand that it's very important to intervene as soon as possible when there is an when there is an issue because that that is that can have an impact on their outcome we know as these children develop their language and skills early the sort of sooner we have can provide hearing for them uh, better uh, the better their outcome is so there are many things that my colleagues will talk about so i'm not going to uh, delve into them now but there are roles for uh, universal screening programs that have really uh, taken a big uh, step here in Saudi Arabia and in our neighboring countries, and also in some uh, some of the Western and European countries as well. Uh, there is also uh, um, a lot of work for these patients, and not only the patients, a lot of the work is done to the parents, and we'll discuss that uh, today as well, and what, what things can we do to help them and how uh, how do we counsel them. And let's not forget, as we are here from different specialities, we work together, not only within the 
pediatric uh, ENT and, and audiovestibular medicine, we also need our pediatrician, the speech language pathologist, the psychologist, and what have you to work together. Uh, so um, from that perspective, uh, I leave the floor for Dr. Sara to let us know what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faisal, for the introduction, and I'm humbled by uh, um, uh, you introducing me and Dr. Muhammad. Hopefully, today uh, we're going to shed the light on this very important topic. Um, so first, uh, we're going to talk about this in sections. The first section will uh, be directed towards understanding the landscape of uh, hearing loss evaluation, uh, the second section will talk about the diagnostic approaches, uh, and then we will talk about uh, intervention strategies, and the last section will talk about counseling uh, of parents and caregivers. Uh, and then we will end this session by a conclusion and uh, questions and answers uh, to the uh, audience. So uh, first of all, Dr. Zawawi, let's start with the basics. Um, how do the pathways of hearing loss and delayed speech intersect in pediatric uh, patients? Well, it's a very important thing to mention is that uh, most of these patients present in different ways. But the classic way for these patients to present is that uh, especially for those that don't get detected as early as we like them to, is that the parents show up with their child thinking that their child, um, asking why are, why is their child not speaking as his siblings? Uh, uh, because what happens is that they come in at the age of three or three and a half where they say, well, the child doesn't really speak as much. And we're not talking about, some, it doesn't have to be something really sinister. It could be as something that's a mild speech delay. And that we, we should always think about our role is not as, yes, it's reassure parents, but it's very important for us to always think about, okay, it doesn't have to always be a behavioral issue. Let's make sure there's nothing organic that we can help with that can be the reason behind this problem. So that's because that's what the, why the parents are coming for, right? They, they, and usually you have two, and there are times that there are two, type, two different parents that show up. There's a mother and father, and one is wants the other to be reassured. So you'd have, for example, the father saying, well, uh, you know, my child is okay. Like my co his cousin is also the same thing. He's not, he didn't speak till the age of four. And the mom would be like the, the one who's trying to push forward and sometimes the other way around. Um, so it's very important to gauge that early on and know how to speak to them because, you know, it's an interconnected pathway. And, you know, the hearing loss is, is an issue because once, if the child doesn't hear well, as you know, they won't be able to speak because that's why I always, the example I always give to the parents is that if you have, for example, someone who is, let's say a Saudi citizen who is born in, let's say Egypt and uh, lived the first five to 10 years of his life in Egypt, you find that his Arabic language is more Egyptian than for example, Hijazi or um, uh, Southern uh, language. It's more of a, Egyptian because that's what he learned out of the environment he is. So that's why it's very important for us to early be able to detect that sound early. So there are many ways to detect the the, uh, the language and the sound and the ability to um, hear early. And one of them is a newborn hearing screening and I won't get into that now. Uh, and there are other ways because there are many uh, pathways for them to, to hear because it doesn't mean that the child has a normal hearing at birth, that they will continue to have normal hearing all the way down till they're at, in the adulthood. That's why it's important for us to have milestones for them to come to us, uh, to see uh, if they're still hearing well, especially during the period where they can't really express their ability to hear. It's also very important for us to know, and the parents have to have to know, then this is a multidisciplinary care. So yes, they won't only see, if there is a hearing loss issue, they'll not only see an ENT, they're probably still gonna see an audiologist, a speech therapist. And if the situation is severe enough, they might end up seeing a psychologist, they might end up seeing multiple other experts of behavior medicine, because they need a multidisciplinary approach to be able to take that child, especially those that have speech delay, from a delayed uh, development child to someone who has a normal or near normal ability to speak. So uh, with that in mind, um, let's delve into something else. Uh, 
if we think about it from that perspective, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Asara, from your perspective as an audiologist, how early can you reliably detect the hearing impairment in infants? And what tools uh, can we do to uh, for you or for you to prioritize it? Um, well, uh, obviously, uh, newborn hearing screening is considered one of the revolutionary things that happen in the, in the audiology science in uh, reliably detecting hearing loss at an early age. Um, uh, we should always keep in mind the Joint Committee of Infant Hearing Benchmark, which states that we should screen at one month, diagnose at three months, and start management at six months. Now, we're going to start talking about the technicalities of the, uh, the, the program. Uh, we have two tests, the distortion product autoacoustic emissions at 30 dB, uh, which is a, an excellent test. The hearing screening program started with this test since it can objectively detect hearing loss in children. Uh, it has a high specificity, around 93%, but a lower uh, sensitivity, around 77%, which means that we could miss children with hearing loss, especially those with auditory neuropathy. Uh, whereas the other test, uh, the automated auditory brainstem response uh, test, the AABR, uh, has a high sensitivity and specificity, around uh, 95%. Uh, and this test is done at a 35 dB. So it uh, lets us uh, assure uh, or be sure that we are uh, detecting children with hearing loss at an early age. Now, the, the the, the thing that we should consider is what protocol should we use? We have these two tests. For example, here in Saudi Arabia, we use both tests. And the reason why we add autoacoustic emissions is because it can detect hearing loss uh, at lower thresholds. So we're not missing even those with mild hearing loss. But if we had the chance to use one test, I would uh, definitely recommend using the AABR and many centers even here in Saudi Arabia are using this protocol. Uh, now we need to remember uh, that the hearing screening is considered, uh, um, yeah, before we talk about that, uh, another way to ensure that we're not missing any children is to look at the risk factors at the newborn uh, stage. Uh, we should look for a uh, family history of permanent hearing loss, hyperbilirubinemia requiring transfusion, craniofacial abnormalities, syndromes that are associated with hearing loss, uh, maternal infections such as torch, and stay in the ICU for more than five days. Uh, if we do all that, we can increase the reliability of detecting hearing loss at an early age. Now, we need to consider that the hearing screening program is considered the form of secondary prevention. We are taking all these children uh, born at the facilities and we are uh, assessing or, or screening uh, for hearing loss. So you will find that most children will pass the test. In fact, we shouldn't have more than 8% uh, not passing the test. Uh, and then when we go to the next step, when they come to the audiology clinic and they do the tests uh, that uh, I'm sure Dr. Mohammed will elaborate on, such as the ABR, the autoacoustic emissions and all that, we will find that most children will be diagnosed with normal hearing. Um, for example, in our clinic, 12% of children who come to the clinic after failing the hearing screening test, 12% uh, of them are diagnosed with hearing loss, and of those, 37% have profound hearing loss. So when we're looking at the numbers, the numbers are very small, but we are looking at changing the uh, course of the lives of children with uh, these uh, sort of disorders. And uh, we are making sure that uh, those children uh, develop optimal or near optimal uh, language and communication skills, uh, those children being those with mild to profound uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So yeah, we can reliably uh, detect hearing loss uh, using the hearing screening program and following this uh, protocol uh, until they reach to the audiology clinic. See, that's wonderful. It's always fascinating to see that we can really detect that issue early. 
So Dr. Muhammad, um, reflecting on these uh, concerns, especially Dr. Sarah mentioned, one of the things she mentioned is that auditory neuropathy and related issues can be challenging to diagnose. How would you um, first think about it? Because usually you guys are the ones that, uh, you're much smarter than us, we're, we're technical in terms of our surgical skills, but uh, you guys are the ones that really are able to, well, say this, this patient has uh, auditory neuropathy. Um, so what are the signs that make you think about that? And um, from, from your, um, as a clinician, and how can you avoid overlooking it at, uh, in the early childhood assessment? Uh, well, good evening, Dr. Faisal. Good evening, Dr. Sarah. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And thanks for everyone who's joining and listening to us today. You know, when considering a child with auditory processing disorders or auditory neuropathies, so it's it's indicative of, of presence of auditorococcal lesions or auditorococcal issues. So usually the affected subject may experience challenges in, in understanding speech, especially in the noisy environments. And, and these difficulties may be more pronounced compared to their ability to detect the pure tones. So the speech discrimination is not comparable to the hearing level of this patient. It's poorer than expected or less than expected. And, and Consequently, this can lead to delayed or disordered speech and language development. For listening skills also, the child with, with, with those orders may exhibit difficulties in paying attention to and following the auditory instructions. So they may require repetition or clarification of information as they struggle to process and comprehend the auditory input effectively. Also, some of them may present with, 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 with the trouble remembering and the recalling of the auditory information could be an indicative sign. That's why the child may encounter difficulties in retaining and recalling the auditory information. This, this can manifest as a challenge in remembering instruction or following a multi-step direction or orders at the same time. And by the end, as a result, of course, he will face academic difficulties because both of them have an impact on academic performance, especially in tasks related to reading, spelling, and language. So I have a follow-up question to that, if you don't mind. Um, so I know that parents come in with a lot of anxiety, especially when they hear auditory neuropathy. Uh, and I thought I know we have a section about uh, counseling pa parents and stuff, but I think I want to spend maybe for one second to elaborate on how can you cool them off in the sense that uh, what are ways for you? Because one of I've had we've had these patients that show up to our clinic saying, "Oh, I have a auditory neuropathy," and they don't have an auditory neuropathy; they just have um, uh, uh, other issues or other schooling issues, education issues. So, is there a way for you to uh, to uh, diag not, not, without delving into the nitty gritty of diagnosis, is for you to simple test that will help you exclude other turn your arm. You mean an objective test? If, uh, objective test, or even let's say, because I know we're going to talk about the objective test. What about like something in there? Um, let's say objective test part. Let's keep it simple. Objective yeah. test. You know. It's, it's easy. I think it's easy nowadays to, to diagnose a case of auditory neuropathy. Presence of autoacoustic emission in absence of the ABR response or presence of the cochlear microphonic in the ABR, it's an indicative of auditory neuropathy or maybe both. Patient has presence of autoacoustic emission and co plus cochlear microphonic, or maybe in some cases we might do the cochleography test so this patient has an auditory neuropathy. But the, 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 the hallmark, I think, of auditory neuropathy is the speech discrimination difficulties. And it's not, not, not comparable to the pure tone of this patient. So the, 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 the family, they are thinking, no, our child is fine. His hearing is fine. But he's not responding to us. Even he has to ask uh, the, 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 for, for, uh, he uh, he has to ask for uh, for, for many times. For example, for the orders, for example. Uh, 
Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so... Um... Uh, I, I think this is my chance to ask you to Zawawi. Sure. Uh, and, and in your point, discussing the rule of genetics on environmental factors, what should all to rhinologists initially focus on during the assessment of the child? So that's that's a good question. Um, if we go back to the scenario that we've mentioned that the child presents to us with uh, either delayed speech or sometimes they show up to the clinic who have the children who have done the screening test, they didn't haven't done the full diagnostic test. They'd show up to clinic saying, well, listen, I have a newborn. Uh, I, I was told that um, he failed a newborn hearing screening, probably an autoacoustic emission or what have you. And um, they, and this is a very common scenario. They told me, well, at the age of six months, come go, go get checked by an ENT. Or the other scenario is that they show up to the office with delayed speech uh, or poor response to sounds. So the first thing I look at is basically in their history. So what I go into the history and delve into it, well, first of all, I want to understand more about the perinatal history and the and if there is any risk factors for, for the child to develop hearing loss. So I always ask about the, the, the pregnancy, what happened during pregnancy. Was it a preterm? Um, uh, uh, was it the patient uh, cesarean section or not? If Because sometimes they tell you, everything is fine, then you dig into it. Okay, so how many weeks was the pregnancy? Oh, it was 34. Okay, why was it 34? Uh, would you deliver C-section? Yes. Because they, the, the family have the tendency of, because they feel that everything was okay, so they want to tell you that everything is okay, part of the reassurance. It's, it's your, your job to dig into this and find why um, they're here. So first of all, the perinatal history is important. Have the child stayed in ICU? If so, why not? Why have they stopped, stayed in the ICU? Was there any perinatal uh, hypoxia and what, what have you? Then we look at other stuff, including consanguinity between the parents. And you'd be, especially in our region, uh, you ask them, are you related to each other? It's like, no, we're not. And then uh, you ask them, okay, so you're not cousins? Or like, well, yeah, my, my father is like, you discover that they're second degree cousins. And that's still a consanguinity situation. The other thing you always ask about as well, if there is any history of uh, the infections, torch infection, because that can lead to hearing loss. Uh, then you, after you make sure of all the technical part, you all delve into their, um, if there is any uh, in regular infections, like touch medias, or if there is any serious infections like meningitis or mumps, Right, because that should uh, because we've had patients you and I where the patient shows up and they had meningitis and they show up three four years afterwards, uh, and sometimes there is nothing we can do about it. Sometimes you are lucky, but sometimes there is nothing we can do about it because the sequel is so bad. Um, and um, then we will move on to the examination. And the first thing and the most common thing sometimes we found is that we have middle ear fusion, and people sometimes underplay the effect of effusion or chronic infusion in children because that 25 or 30 dB or 35 dB loss uh, in, in hearing levels is can really impact children. And uh, you just think about yourself, if, you have, if your ear is impacted by wax, you won't be able to hear as well. And, and sometimes I will always remember that time during training when I was in surgery doing with my work with my program director and I had wax in my ears. I didn't know that I had wax in my ears. And he was talking to me and I wasn't, I wasn't listening to him because of the noise environment in the operating room. And then after I removed the wax, everything was fine. And that's much less than a tight media with effusion. So yes, it can cause hearing loss. And we have many, many patients who once we've put the tubes in, the, uh, the hearing loss, uh, the hearing improved and the child immediately started talking. So uh, for me, that's where I, I start to think about it from that perspective. So it's important to have that initial assessment. Then you have to think about, is this, if there is a consanguinity, is there a genetic issue? Then uh, you look at if there is a patient has any syndromic features and what have you, because we all know that there's a significant portion of patients, almost half, 50% of them who have sensory neural hearing loss at birth, have either a syndromic, it's a, could be a hereditary issue. And that hereditary issue, 60% of them uh, have hereditary issue. And from that, a good proportion of them would have a genetic problem. So that's why it's important for us to know and be able to identify. And also part of their assessment, once we diagnose them, we have to refer them for genetic, genetic assessment or geneticists. 
but it's very important for us to be able to collaborate with a genetic team. Uh, and sometimes that's challenging because in most centers, we don't have many geneticists and they're overwhelmed, but that's why we try to sometimes try to get the genetics test done or uh, if there is, if everything is negative and going, we try sometimes to ration our resources, but in a perfect world, we want every single child who has hearing loss to be seen by geneticists because they really are important to help us, first of all, complete the diagnosis because hearing loss can be one symptom of a complex syndrome and also be able to counsel the family better about what do they expect for their or the other children and for the future offspring that they might might want to have. So for that reason, it's important to think that way. Now, there are some environmental factors and the environmental factors can be as simple as, well, they have middle ear fusion due to adenoid hypertrophy that is caused by allergies or infections and whatnot. But other environmental factor could be related to acquired hearing loss. That acquired hearing loss could be related to mumps a virus, could be related to meningitis, could be related to, there is, there doesn't have to be sensory neural hearing loss, could be related to recurrent acute test media that resulted in chrysotoma or what have you. So these are all acquired factors that are, are important to have and we, uh, we sh should always think about. So in, in that aspect, I'm gonna bounce the ball back to you, Dr. Mohammed, and say, now, um, could you, and I tried to poke you before, but I pulled back. Can you talk about and elaborate more about advancement in diagnosing in audiology? What can we do from audiological tests and what have changed in the field over the past years that help us able to be able to, uh, first of all, assess and also approach children with hearing loss? Definitely, you know, diagnostic audiology nowadays has a witnessed remarkable advancement that have greatly influenced our approach to pediatric with a he uh, for, for hearing assessments. Starting from, from, from the newborn he hearing screening, as my colleague Sarah mentioned that, as we know, early identification of hearing loss is a crucial for optimal speech and language development in child. And, and, and in the recent years, we have seen the implementation of effective the newborn hearing screening programs. Nowadays, the, the, the age of, of cochlear implantation is decreasing. Nowadays, we, we can implant a patient at 10 months old. And, and, the, uh, and these programs primarily, you know, I mean, employ two objective measures, the autoacoustic imaging and the ABR, the, the screening one. And, and, and one of the significant advancement in diagnostic audiology is, is the integration of the objective measures, which provide an accurate and reliable information without relying on subjective responses from, from the child, from the young child, including diagnostic autoacoustic emission, diagnostic ABR, and tympanometer to check the middle ear status, the autoacoustic emission to, to check the cochlear function, and the ABR to check the um, 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 many pathologies we can check through the ABR. And, and, and by using these measures allow us to assess various aspects of auditory function and provide valuable insights into how the uh, into a child hearing abilities. For example, the auditory neuropathies. We can diagnose a patient with auditory neuropathies, so at least during the counseling, okay, we can inform the parents about the diagnosis of this, of this child and the intervention also and the outcomes. And for the older child, the behavior assessment techniques also play a crucial role in evaluating the hearing abilities of a child, especially, you know, for the older ones who can actively participate, uh, participate in, in our tests for example, play audiometer involves engaging the child in play activities while presenting different sounds and getting response from them. So it's allowing us to observe their responses. The VRA, the visual response audiometry, which utilizes visual reinforcement to encourage the child to respond to the auditory stimuli. If he is, of course, not cooperative to, to, to the play audiometer, and finally, another significant advancement is, is the utilization of effort potential testing. 
for example, the cortical auditory evoked potentials, which help identify the auditory processing disorders and provide insight into how the brain, how the brain processing the sound. That's wonderful. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sabai, um, in your um, in your field and in, in cases of speech delay without clear hearing loss, how do you proceed in evaluating these children to make sure that nothing is missed? Uh, well, uh, this is a tricky um, uh, issue, uh, but I want to emphasize on a point. Um, any parental concern, especially uh, regarding speech delay, is a valid concern that we should assess thoroughly uh, to make sure that we're not missing anything. Another point that we should consider is that when the parents come to you and tell you, oh, our child here is fine, we need to consider that mild hearing loss can go unnoticeable sometimes. So we need to dig uh, more and make sure that we're not missing even uh, mild hearing loss in those children. Um, so we need to think about what might cause speech delay in a child with normal or near normal hearing loss. Uh, the first thing, of course, if we're considering mild hearing loss, uh, we should think of otitis media with effusion. Um, now, otitis media with effusion could lead to, uh, it's the most common cause for conductive hearing loss, and which could lead to mild hearing loss. And if it happens at an early age, if it was recurrent, uh, if it went unnoticed for a very long time, it could lead to a speech delay. Of course, if it's associated with factors such as uh, diminished stimulation uh, at home, uh, the, the communication with parents and fellow children uh, is not that good, that could also lead to speech uh, delay. Uh, a study that I recently did found that there was a significant uh, worsening of speech uh, recognition in uh, children with the Titus media with effusion. So, uh, bad speech recognition might also mean um, uh, uh, delay in speech uh, and language development. Um, other causes could be uh, due to developmental delay, uh, oral motor uh, disorders, uh, things like uh, apraxia or dysarthria. Now, these could be more obvious. Uh, other specialties could look uh, into that, but you might be the first person the child, the parents approach you uh, regarding their child's uh, speech delay. Uh, of course, we shouldn't forget behavioral issues, uh, neuro neurodivergent disorders, and of course, uh, uh, auditory processing disorders, among other causes, of course. So uh, what I would suggest is that uh, we should start with the history and take your time with the history, make sure that you're not missing anything. So when you're asking about the presenting symptom, uh, you should make sure, is it just the speech delay? Uh, did you notice that the child is not responding quickly to their name? Uh, do they prefer the TV sound to be uh, at a louder volume? Um, uh, do they have a problem uh, following orders? We're thinking things like Dr. Muhammad uh, shed the light on things that could be related to auditory processing disorders. Of course, um, we need to uh, consider things related to the middle ear. For example, is the child tugging on their ear? Uh, do they have infections? Do they have any allergic rhinitis? The child is uh, not uh, is, is snoring at night. Things that we just need to make sure that we're not missing anything related to the middle ear. Of course, we need to have a and and I I I I, I want to make sure that everyone in the field of audiology or speech or in this area should know your milestones. You, you need to know uh, what are the skills that a child should acquire at every age and what are the standard deviation? When is it, when it is uh, okay for a child to not have two uh, word sentences? Uh, so uh, you need to ask about the language milestones. And uh, another thing, uh, we should not only ask about the language milestones, we should ask about the motor milestones. Ask about when the child had neck stability, started crawling, walking, 
uh, how is the feeding? Um, all these are very important. You need to make sure that you know uh, what the child is going through. Um, like I said, you might be the one who uh, refers them to pediatrics and uh, make, to, to ensure that uh, the child gets checked uh, in, in, in that area of uh, development. Uh, we need to also ask about the behavior of the child. Um, are there any atypical behaviors? Are there any red flags? And I, I want to um, emphasize on a point that we should not mislead the, the parents uh, to thinking that their child might have a problem. Uh, uh, assessing children and, and making sure uh, that uh, they have a problem that we, we need to, they need to go through a very thorough evaluation from the uh, right specialty, for example, pediatrics, psychiatry, psychology. Uh, so, but knowing these uh, symptoms and and red flags allows us to uh, refer them to the right specialty. Uh, of course, we need to ask about the social aspect of the child. Um, does the child, how many siblings does the child have? Uh, does the child go to school? How are they doing in school academically? Uh, and um, of course, one very important thing that you should ask the parents about is the screen time. Uh, screen time, meaning how much time do they spend on electronics and iPads? Uh, everyone knows how much uh, of a problem this is nowadays. And recent studies have found that a two hour, more than two hours screen time is significantly correlated with speech delay because you're lacking communication with others. Uh, you think that your child is benefiting from the videos that they're watching, but communication is crucial to develop uh, uh, language skills. Uh, so of course you need to counsel the parents and tell them that they should limit their uh, screen time for, for their kids, especially if they tell you that they spend a very long time on iPads, but you shouldn't immediately disregard the, the, the problem as, oh uh, yeah, it's, it's the iPads. Of course, we need to ask about the, any hearing evaluation that the child did, uh, did they do hearing screening tests, and we need to, to, to dig more uh, regarding the risk factors. Something could be progressive, it's just starting, and uh, they, they, they didn't get the right uh, evaluation at the beginning, so we need to ask about the risk factors. And of course, we need to make sure that uh, we're asking about any chronic diseases. Of course, these could uh, affect the speech uh, in those children. And then we then we we go uh, on to the examination. Now, the examination uh, depends on uh, your specialty. If you can be, uh, if if you could uh, examine the child uh, neurologically, uh, look at the muscular. Uh, uh, examination, that's fine. But if, if we're talking from an audiology point of view, you need to do, of course, ear examination, um, uh, otolaryngology uh, uh, um, examination of the nose and the, and, the, and, the, and the mouth and the tongue is also important. Um, then we go on to the impedance testing, like Dr. Mohammed uh, talked about, look at the middle ear, check for any otitis media, and then we should go on to the audiological evaluation and it should be based on the age. And I would, I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for subjective testing. Um, train yourself to uh, uh, evaluate the child using subjective tests like play audiometry. Uh, you'd be surprised of what the results uh, can show you. And the last thing is that uh, also adding to what Dr. Muhammad talked about, speech tests. Speech tests is an excellent way to uh, assess hearing in those children and detect even the slightest hearing loss. And not only hearing, it can give you an idea of the skills that the child has, the discrimination, the recognition, uh, especially if they were automated, you can let the child do the test without having to uh, interact with the child. Of course, doing the test in quiet and in noise will also give you an idea of the processing uh, abilities of the child. So uh, make sure that you're covering everything before saying that, well, the child 
just need some time, uh, just talk to them more. Uh, you, know, you, you need to make sure that you're not missing out on anything. Um, so I think now we should uh, go to the um, next section, which is intervention strategy. So this is a question for you, Dr. Faisal. So once a diagnosis of hearing loss is made, what are the key considerations in choosing between surgical interventions, hearing aids, or cochlear implants? So from usually, as you know, uh, a lot of these patients either show up to our uh, doorstep with a hearing test that was done in another institution. Um, and those are the ones that come in with the most questions, right? Because uh, we're lucky if they come from you guys because you have had many discussions with them and they would come in somewhat comfortable listening to me talk for a few minutes and then they have most of the information they need. But we have a significant portion that come to my clinic that are not uh, seen by you guys. So they've done a hearing test somewhere uh, that showed a, some sort of uh, hearing loss and they need counseling. So the first thing we would think about for me is first of all, is to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, confirmed that the child actually has the hearing that um, uh, the that the audio audiological test have if it wasn't done in our institution. So that's the first thing I would think about. Second of all, uh, what comes to mind is this hearing loss reversible or non-reversible? In the sense that if the child has something like that's me doing a fusion, that's a reversible hearing loss because hopefully once we remove the, the hearing loss. Uh, we will be able to have um, a better understanding. But there are more sinister and more severe um, challenges that come with more complex children. So we've put a question down in the field now. We want uh, the part of the attendees, if you don't mind, to answer this. What do you find the biggest challenge in counseling parents of children with hearing loss? Let's see, we've ha we have four possible answers that explain the diagnosis and intervention options, managing parents' expectation regarding outcome, encouraging consistent use of hearing devices at home and providing emotional and psychological support to families. So we want the most challenging one. So while you guys answer to this, I'll continue answering uh, the question. So in the sense that, um, so it's important, first of all, to diagnose if it's reversible or not. Then we look at severity. If the child had mild hearing loss, it's a different thing to compare it to child with severe gift found hearing loss. If the child has mild, mild to moderate hearing loss, then we're talking about something supportive, something that is uh, uh, that will help the child continue to grow. So there are occasions where if it's very, very mild hearing loss, it just requires, like for example, if they only losing 20 to 25 dB, and then let's say 25 dB to 30 dB, sometimes we elect to observe the child, do nothing, and make sure that the child is growing well, make sure it, that they have favorable um, positions in school, like they're not sitting back in, in, at the back of the room, make sure that the parents are talking to them uh, in close proximity, and so on and so forth. Then if the child has a more severe uh, hearing loss, like it's moderate uh, or even severe, then we would start to introducing other technologies, for example, the hearing aids, which is a, a cornerstone for any child or any patient who has hearing loss. Because before we advance ourselves to a more urgent, uh, more uh, interventional, or more, um, um, I'm losing my words, uh, uh, more aggressive solutions like surgical solutions, then we first start with a non-surgical solutions, uh, which is a, a, hearing, uh, a hearing aid. And there are children, for example, that are cannot use hearing aids, that children for, uh, that have microtia, which is, as you know, a, a condition, a congenital condition where there is an, a missing ear pinna or a small ear pinna, if they have canal atresia, where the canal is either small or non-existent, as in developed, those patients need other types of non-surgical options, for example, the non-surgical bone conduction device, and there are multiple uh, ones in the market, They're, all of them are uh, produce great outcomes. Um, and then after that, we would think about if the child has a sensory neuro hair loss uh, that is severe enough that require, and they're not responding to uh, uh, hearing aids, then we'll progress to the surgical option of cochlear implantation. Now, it's very important to also highlight that even if the child shows up to your doorstep with severe to profound hearing loss, they have to be fitted with hearing aids for two reasons. 
first of all, until they get, if you think they get, I mean, the cochlear implants, until they get the cochlear implant, this will provide some auditory uh, input uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the brain, uh, even if it's uh, negligible, it's still better than nothing. And the second of all, which is very important, it would it would start habilitating the child of wearing something around their ear, which uh, makes putting the sound processor of a cochlear implant not a not a foreign experience for them. It becomes more of a familiar thing to them if they're used to wearing hearing aids. And we know that our children that have used hearing aids uh, extensively do better and have better data logging with cochlear implantations. Um, lastly, there are conditions where we have to jump the line and go to a cochlear implant right away. And this situation usually uh, pertains to those who have had meningitis. If they've had meningitis and we have a documented uh, severe hearing loss, we have to proceed to cochlear implantation without um, thinking about hearing aids. And the reason behind that is that these children are at a high risk of developing something called labyrinthitis ossificans, which is ossification of the uh, cochlea. And if that happens, that may affect the ability to have a cochlear implantation down the line. So it's urgent for us. And we've implanted children at young age, some of them younger than six months old, uh, just because they've showed up with meningitis and we had to proceed with uh, urgent cochlear implantation. So as you can see, there are many uh, intercranies of making this decision. And it's very important to keep the family and the child themselves, especially if they're older children, uh, involved in the in the care and in understanding that this is something that's going to change their lifestyle. They have to understand that, yes, it's going to, and, and most of them worry about this, that it's going to change their lifestyle, but it's not it's necessarily changing it to the worst. Because if the child doesn't hear, we know that from a study we conducted that we're publishing it soon, is that their quality of life is poor. Whereas after they receive a, a appropriate auditory uh, uh, amplification or cochlear implantation, their quality of life improves significantly. And that is very important to always highlight. And also we have, they have to understand regardless of where does the child end up going and what do they need, this child will end up needing ongoing evaluation regularly by their surgeon, by the audiologist, the speech therapist, and sometimes also continuous support by psychologists and pediatricians. So let's look at the answers for um, the the uh, the uh, the attendees. So most the majority have said that it was about thirty and nine, almost forty percent said that explaining the diagnosis and intervention option is usually the most challenging thing. Following uh, the fall, uh, the the next uh, was uh, providing emotional and psychological support for the families. And yes, I, I tend to agree with that in the sense that sometimes it's difficult for the parents to understand um, what do their child have because one of the things. And I think we we can take a moment to elaborate on that. Is that we have many cases where the parents show up saying, "Well, I don't believe you that my child doesn't hear because uh, they when I close the door really hard, they hear. Uh, when a loud noise happens, they hear. So it's difficult and it's difficult for them to differentiate between meaningful sound." and uh, non-meaningful sound, or, or sometimes it's not even sound, it's, it's the vibration of the surrounding, uh, of the, the air around them and the tel vibration uh, of, the, of the environment around them that caused them to, to, to turn. And there are many cues that these children try to use to, to, uh, to adapt with their inability to hear. So it's very difficult to explain that diagnosis to them and following, yes, the emotional and psychological support that the police family need. Uh, so, from that, let's talk about um, what you might call it. Let's now think about the, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Um, what's uh, well, let's go back to let's talk to uh, Dr. Muhammad. What what strategies uh, do you think have been proven effective in educating and supporting parents through diagnosis and treatment and during this journey? Now, maybe let's talk about the auditory rehabilitation program to the needs you mean? Sure, let's let's go back to that. I skipped a, I skipped a few lines. So let's go back to continuing their um on uh, the same panel and leave that till the end. I probably skipped the gun a little bit here. I apologize to you guys. Um if we wanted to focus more on auditory rehabilitation programs, 
what do you think are the needs uh, for these children and their families? And what okay. technology is available? Okay, first, first, let's agree that the, the auditory rehabilitation is a complex process aimed at improving the quality of life for, for individuals with the hearing loss. So it includes a range of intervention strategies and technologies designed to address the challenges faced by those who experience auditory impairment. And, and the hearing loss alone affects not only, you know, the physical ability to perceive sound, but also it has emotional well-being, communication, and the, the social interaction. So we are calling this a holistic approach, considering the whole person rather than just the auditory system. So the oral rehabilitation depends on individual needs as dictated by the current age of the child, the age of onset on, on, on the hearing loss, the age at which the hearing loss was discovered, severity of the hearing loss, the type of the hearing loss, and the extent of the hearing loss, and the age at which amplification was introduced. So the first step in auditory rehab involves a thorough assessment, the audiologist, to evaluate the degree and the type of the hearing loss communication needs and personal goals and the expectation also from the family. Because of course, the, the oral rehabilitation for a child with a mild sense of oral hearing loss is totally different from a child with a severe profound. Child with with the conductive from mixed hearing loss is totally different from child with 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 severe to profound sensory and hearing loss. So the oral rehabilitation for child typically involved many, for example, starting from the auditory training and the brain plasticity. And the auditory training is not just about the ears; it's about the training the brain, because we are hearing by our brain, not by our ears. So the auditory training programs involve exercises that challenge the, the brain to process sounds more efficiently. And the goal of these programs to increase the awareness of sound, sound localizations, sound discrimination, and how to attach the meaning to the sounds. So auditory perception also should include developing skills in, in hearing with hearing aids and assistive listening devices and how to handle the easy and difficult listening situations. In some patients, we might use, for example, the, the visual cues. And this not goes beyond, you know, distinguishing the sounds and words on the lip reading, no? Could involve all kinds of visual cues that giving meaning to a message. For example, the facial ex expression, the body language. Also, we should improve the speech for, 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 for the patient or for the, for the child. That's why it involved skill development, you know, in production of speech sounds uh, and, and also the voice equality, speaking character, breath control, loudness and speech rhythm. Also, the, the oral rehab should involve how to develop the language, the reception and the expression according, of course, to the, the, to the developmental expectations. And, and, that, and, 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 and finally, that the most important nowadays, the assistive listening devices, the technology, as we know, it play a crucial role in the rehabilitation. These devices, the, the, the aim is to enhance the sound perception and communication. Example, the hearing aids. The, the, the cochlear implants, the best solution for patients with severe to profound sensorineural hearing loss. And finally, the FM system, the wireless systems that you transmit sound directly to the listener and will allow them to actively participate in discussions and stay connected all the time. So it will improve the, the, the signal over the noise. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Sara, uh, the, the, integrating the speech therapy in terms of the timing, techniques, I know that this is a bit um, uh, uh, not what you do every day, but as an audiologist, how closely should the audiologist and speech therapist work together? Because it, I think it's sometimes we feel that uh, when I send a patient to you as a surgeon, uh, we're a bit distant, but then we communicate and we collaborate together. But how does it work for you guys and the speech therapist? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to uh, point out that when we're talking about the benchmark that says that we should screen at one month, diagnose at three, uh, and then start management at six months, we're not only starting uh, management with hearing aids, for example, uh, or cochlear implants, uh, we are starting speech therapy. So yes, we should work closely. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the main thing that we work together in uh, is when, um, for example, the child goes to speech therapy and they have a problem producing certain sounds or words or letters, then uh, a, a report from the speech therapy will let us know that we should work on these certain frequencies and vice versa. If, for example, uh, we uh, worked uh, during the programming on certain frequencies, uh, we could uh, notify the uh, speech therapy through a report that, well, we improved the gain here. Uh, you can start working on uh, these, uh, these sounds. So yes, we should work together. As Dr. Mohammed said, it's a holistic approach we, uh, to, in order to provide the best uh, uh, chances for the child. Uh, Dr. Faisal, I think you're... Yes, uh, I'm, I'm using myself. Am I getting old? Maybe I'm getting old. Uh, so um, the uh, we'll, we'll, I know there are a few questions here, and we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the, 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 the webinar, which is not far from now. I just wanted to take a moment to invite everyone to attend MESPO 2024, which will be on October 17 to 19 in the beautiful city of ours, Jeddah. Um, and uh, we still open for abstract submissions. We accept abstracts from all our clinicians that deal with children with ear and nose and throat disorders, whether they're physicians, uh, uh, ENTs, uh, pediatricians, audiologists, speech therapists, psychologists, any person or, or, uh, that deals with uh, uh, clinically with children with hearing uh, with any multiple ENT disorders, please submit your work. We would love to have you, whether as, a, as, a, as an attendee or join collaborating with us uh, here. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so the next part here is counseling parents and caregivers. And, and I think we saw from the poll of our uh, wonderful um, audience is that they really highlighted that communicating with parents, whether through explaining the diagnosis and, and, and the options of treatment or uh, in terms of uh, psychologically counseling the parents is often the challenging part uh, for the care for this child. So um, I'll leave the floor to Dr. Mohammed first. To tell us what are the strategies he has proven effective in educating and supporting parents through diagnosing and treatment and treatment of the journey of a child with hearing loss. Well, educating and supporting parents through the diagnosis and treatment journey can significantly contribute to positive outcomes for both the parents and the child. That's why, you know, several strategies have proven to be effective. For example, clear and comprehensive information. We should provide the parents with a clear and accurate information about the diagnosis treatment options, and our available resources. And during the, 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 the appointment of the counseling, we have to use our plain language and avoid the medical terms of the gargon to ensure the parents can understand and make their informed decisions. And, and of course, we have actively listened to the parents' concerns, fears, and questions. In some cases, we might use a multidisciplinary team approach. We, 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 we could refer the patient to other specialties, to other doctors, for example, to the psychologists, to the therapists and educators. Because, you know, we believe this collaborative approach ensures a comprehensive support and allows parents to access a variety of expertise and perspectives. Also, we can offer the parent to training programs and workshops that focus on a specific topic related to the diagnosis and treatment. 
And because these can, of course, these can include behavior management strategies, communication techniques. And we have not to forget the, the role of the support groups. We have to facilitate support groups where parents can connect with, uh, with others. And maybe this is the most important with others facing the similar uh, challenges. Because these groups provide a, a safe space for, for, for sharing, you know, experiences, seeking advice with others and, and building a support network. Uh, and, and we have to ensure that the parents have access to relevant uh, resources such as, you know, educational materials, webinars, online forums, and community organizations. And, and, and finally, uh, the long-term follow-up follow to establish a system for a long-term follow-up to monitor the progress, provide ongoing support, and, and we have to address the new challenges that may arise over time. This will help the parents to feel supported even after the initial diagnosis and treatment stage. And, and, and in summary, we have to remember that each family's needs and preferences may vary. So it's essential to, to approach the support process with flexibility and adaptability. I totally agree with what you said. And I think uh, I'm gonna take a moment to plug something here uh, shamelessly. Um, we have uh, worked on a, a project about assess the quality and readability of uh, patient-directed uh, online resources for cochlear implant in children. And we realized it was fascinating. Uh, I, I went onto this, we as a group, we went to this to delve and find what is available for families. And we realized that the, the online material that is currently available for patients is one, either very difficult to read, or two, is of poor quality. And that is almost exclusively, almost all websites were like that. And uh, I encourage you guys to read this article that was published uh, last year in uh, the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Laryngologic Surgery. Um, leaving it here for you guys to see. Uh, but anyways, so, uh, but yes, so we need to, as physicians, as uh, uh, audiologists and uh, speech therapists, and as a community, we have to work together to um, um, build better resources for them because they, they, most parents who show up to show to our doorstep before that they have read online uh, about that. And a, a, until the, uh, I've had a patient that uh, the last patient I referred to you uh, on Wednesday, he had so much information. I was shocked about, he started delving into uh, different, uh, what would you do for cochlear implantation? Um, is it better to do unilateral or bilateral? He went into, and he's someone who it looks like he read and tried to read and he and we're, we're getting more and more of these uh, patients to us. So um, talking about patients, I think if you can guys, both of you elaborate on, for example, can you share an insight uh, or a case study where you felt that the parent's involvement significantly influenced the child's progress? Yes, Dr. Mohammed. Sure. You know, I have, I have a six-year-old girl. She was diagnosed as a case of bilateral severe trochoplasm centineural hearing loss at the age of two years, and that time, and she's a case of auditory neuropathy. The cochlear microphonic was positive. She underwent cochlear implantation, maybe a, a bilateral cochlear implantation, at three years old. You know, however, after one year post surgery, her speech outcomes, you know, were not satisfactory. We suspected that already during the counseling. We informed the family, she is a case of auditory neuropathy, so maybe the outcomes is, is variable. You know, to support her development, her mother dedicated, dedicated her time to be with her child as she talked. A job teaching in the same school as her child focused on, and, and she was focused on Quran teachings. And by following this intervention, her daughter's progress improved significantly to the point where really early, it became difficult to distinguish her from a hearing person uh, with a person with normal hearing when engaging her in, in, in a conversation. 
Yeah, um, I think um, this case really highlights the importance of the parent's role in uh, their uh, child's language development and that uh, parents should believe in their children's abilities uh, and, and uh, allow them to be challenged and, and push them without pressuring them to um, try to uh, um, progress in their skills. Uh, we, we've, we've known for a very long time, that our knowledge about cochlear implants evolved over time. We thought kids with cochlear implants, it's very hard for them to memorize, for example. That was, that was a very old uh, idea. But now we know that they could, and we've seen uh, how the children are doing, especially if it they were implanted early and they had the good uh, support. So uh, yes, I, I think that the role of parents is is very important, and it, it could really help with the uh, language development in children. Wonderful. I think I can echo that myself, uh, and I. I think I know who you're talking about, and that's just fascinating. We have so many uh, patients uh, that uh, their families influence. Uh, hmm? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. She, your kiss. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's it's just that what 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 was fascinating about families is that it goes both ways. Thankfully, we have so many positive uh, responses in this. We've had a couple what where the responses where the family did not react, did not uh, support their child as much as we wanted them to. And in these situations, we really worked hard to them and we tried to bring them to our clinic more frequently. And sometimes you felt, okay, maybe bringing them more frequently is not good. Maybe let's give them space, maybe get the psychologist to work with them and what have you. But yes, thankfully we've been quite lucky. I think we have great patients that are really passionate about their the care of their of their kids. Uh, so um, I think on this uh, note, let's uh, look at the Q and A's if you guys don't mind. Uh, we have a few of them. Uh, I'm gonna put the questions out there and I'll let you guys uh, take a uh, crack at them. So we have the first um, question. Is it important to diagnose the type of auditory neuropathy? And if it is pre or post synaptic disorder, does it affect the candidacy for cochlear implantation or prognosis? Uh, Dr. Mohammed, maybe take an answer to this. Of course, it's it's important to, to diagnose if this patient has auditory neuropathy or not, because there, as I mentioned, they have a retrocochlear lesion, and, and and still they have a speech discrimination difficulties. So their outcome is usually different from other patients from other childs. And 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 it's it's very difficult and it's it's impossible to uh, to, to diagnose a patient as presynaptic or postsynaptic pre or pre cochlear implantation. We can do that uh, through the electrical ABR after the cochlear implantation or intraoperatively. Are are they still candidate? In, in, in my opinion, the candidacy in, in cochlear implantation is a good candidate for cochlear implantation or not a good candidate or absolute co contraindication. So I think those patients, are, they are still candidate for cochlear implantation, but they are still in, 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 in the gray line. We have to explain for the family regarding the, the outcomes. We have to do for them a good counseling for them. Maybe the patient will detect the uh, detect the sound, but he will not have uh, a speech discrimination. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to elaborate here a little bit. So the way I look at it, and yes, sometimes very difficult to determine if they are presynaptic or postsynaptic, especially if they have normal MRI, like the MRI showing a decent sized nerve. Uh, there are. Uh, people like to group things into presynaptic and most uh, postsynaptic to simplify things. It's much more complex than that because it uh, presynaptically there are different pathologies that can uh, affect uh, the um, the uh, the uh, the um, the the presynapses and postsynaptic the same thing. Like you can go and do if you have a, a nerve hypoplasia, it is considered a postsynaptic or neuropathy. That is a completely different than uh, someone who has. Uh, issue in the synapses itself. Um, so 
if they there are one of the ways to diagnose this is genetics. So if you end up having the uh, auto F gene, you know this is likely a presynaptic situation, and this is really the gene that there was a lot of discussion about genetic um, gene therapy uh, injections and trying to cure or improve the uh, uh, the inner hair cells because that's an issue with the inner hair cells. And the idea, if you wanted to think about it, people say that okay, the presynaptic, a lot of most of the presynaptic uh, uh, issues you would think they would do better with cochlear implantation and it makes sense that they would do better with cochlear implantation because in many situations, if it's an, uh, if you put a cochlear implant there, you're probably bypassing the problem. You're still somewhat bypassing the problem. So you should theoretically have a better outcome. And there are more studies on that compared to postsynaptic outcomes uh, and postsynaptic outcomes. There are some that have uh, decent outcomes as well, but the whole bag is, there are not a lot of studies about the significant of the uh, that are with high volume patients that can tell you that the outcome uh, is as good as uh, those who have sensory loss due to outer hair cells issues. Um, but yes, I think I agree with Dr. Muhammad. Uh, they are, I think, if they have a nerve and they have a cochlea, they are candidates for cochlear implantation. Even if they have a deficient nerve, if it's bilateral situation, I think they still should go for cochlear implantation because uh, going for an ABI is uh, often not an ideal situation. And there are many programs for those who have missing nerve, they would still implant with a cochlear implant before moving into an ABI because if the, we, we know that there are some fibers that can be carried over the vestibular nerve or sometimes uh, the, the fibers are not fully seen in the MRI, so it's difficult to judge them uh, on 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 that assessment. For that reason, we would uh, consider going for um, a cochlear implantation. There are centers as well that do intraoperative assessments, like, like Dr. Mohammed mentioned, whether uh, electrical uh, uh, electrical uh, electro electrocochleograms and whatnot, the cochleography, just to see what's going on. But still, th a lot of this is also experimental, so um, we have to be careful how we counsel our uh, patients. So, Dr. Sarah, do you have anything to add? Uh, Dr. Hamid, we have yeah. something else. Just I would like to add one point. I'm totally agree with you. That's why patients with auditory neuropathy, even if they have, in my, uh, my opinion, even if they have moderate or moderate severe sensorineural hearing loss with limited benefit from the hearing aids, they are a candidate for a cochlear implantation. And we we implanted many patients on their doing Dr. Sarah, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, I think you're missing, but yeah, yeah, I uh, know I agree. Yeah. Okay. What about ASSR and the spastic frequencies bone terse test for infants during early investigation? Dr. Yeah. Sari, you wanted to answer um, this? Yeah, ideally, yes. Uh, if a child uh, comes to you uh, after not passing uh, the uh, hearing screening test. Uh, part of the evaluation should include the AVR uh, using click, of course, and the tone burst uh, to look uh, for thresholds in the lower frequencies. Uh, ASSR uh, uh, is also a very useful tool, especially if you have uh, different thresholds at different frequencies. Uh, I, typically, they are very useful in also um, uh, programming the, the hearing aid, especially if you're uh, going to go ahead and start the management. So uh, ABR, ASSR, um, uh, ABR at click and tone, and of course, autoacoustic emissions, as well as the cochlear microphonics in case the child has hearing loss. And uh, of course, echocleography could uh, help us also detect uh, cochlear microphonics in children with uh, profound hearing. Uh, Dr. Faisal, I think uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Again. Again. Technologies. Okay, so um, there are two questions that are somewhat connected to each other. I'm going to take a shot at them and we can elaborate on them. The first question, any age restrictions for to go for implant? I think they are talking about young and old. Um, and the uh, the other question here is, 
uh, what will be the maximum age limit for cochlear implants? So I think both are quite similar. So I'm going to start talking and you guys maybe chip in. So the uh, American guidelines for cochlear implantation have lowered the age for cochlear, the FDA, FDA approval for age for, for cochlear implantation to nine months old. And the way I look at it is that at the moment, I wouldn't, there are some guidelines, there are some boundaries that we try to adhere to. But we know from uh, a lot of the studies that are being conducted is that when cochlear implants started, it was for adults only. Then it was it would move to children, and it was initially not for children younger than two. Then it was children 18 months, then 12 months, no nine months. Because we the more we study this, we understand that the young, the, the earlier we can provide meaningful sound, the better the child will do. So that's why I would say my restriction for cochlear implantation for as young as they go is that we want to provide adequate hearing as soon as possible. But there's also the limitations of how early do we diagnose them. And the other thing, the other limitation is that we want to give some time for the hearing aids. Uh, because we want to make sure the child we want to make sure the child is not responding to hearing aids, and the other thing we want to make sure the child has time to get at the acclimated for a sound processor or hearing aid on their ear. So that's something to do. So at the moment, I would say for most patients, at nine months is the accepted uh, time to start uh, implanting cochlear implants, unless they have uh, other conditions, like for example meningitis that you have to implant them early. And I know one of my colleagues that, uh, that trained with me did uh, cochlear implantation for, a, for an infant at the age of three months because of the meningitis. Uh, my youngest, I think, was six months, I think. But they, he, it was three months for him. Uh, we're not competing, but it's just we're trying to get them as, as, as early as possible. Now, how, what is the age limit for cochlear implantation from terms of being old, too old for an implant? So now we're talking only for children. So I'm going to divide them into congenitally deaf child, basically the child born with poor hearing uh, and the child that has progressive hearing loss. The child that has progressive hearing loss, there's really no age limit because once they become candidates for cochlear implantation, they get a cochlear implant. The child that has bilateral profound deafness at birth, uh, then we know that if they get, or at least, from the literature that we have so far, if they get implanted older than four, they don't do as better as if they were implanted younger than four. I'm talking about profoundly deaf from, from birth, not like moderate to severe where they had hearing aid and they would receive, they were receiving amplification and they were doing okay, then wasn't enough for them. No, I'm talking about children who have profoundly deaf. Those children older than four, they don't do well. Now, this is the dilemma we always get to. Okay, you, you have a child that is six years old, that is, or five and a half years old, that is bilateral profound deaf since birth. Do you implant them or not? Then it becomes a lot, something that we have to significantly counsel the parents on. I am one of those who believe we still don't know the absolute limits for cochlear implantation. And I think if we take a, a, a lesson out of our history, a chapter out of the history of our patients with auditory neuropathy, we know that these children need a long-term rehabilitation. And we have a few case studies of these children that were implanted late. They did not start to develop their sound or their, their speech until the, uh, two years after implantation because the brain plasticity needs time to get going in that auditory, uh, auditory system. Uh, so that needs time. And I think the longer they use it, the likelihood and the more rehabilitation uh, per they do, the likelihood they would have, uh, they would benefit from the cochlear implant. That is said, I think we have to be cautious how do we counsel these families because to set the expectation or oh, the child will be superstar and they'll hear absolutely perfectly and they'll speak like they have nothing, that's a wrong expectation. The family will not be satisfied. I think it's important for us to set the expectations right and, and they understand that they have a late implantee child, but they our goal here is to be able to appreciate sound and get some speech and hopefully develop the speech as we go. 
Now, the last bucket that I haven't, that we didn't, I didn't speak about is the children with single-sided deafness. These are children that were born deaf in one ear. I'm not talking about progressive, I'm talking born deaf in one ear, and they have good hearing in the other ear. So far, from the limited research that we have, we, we, we can say that if these children get implanted older than seven years of age, they don't do good. And, and they don't use their implant and they become something, they become non-user. They just have a, an implant that they don't use because they're not getting meaningful sound. And from that, for, for that reason, older than seven, eight years old, sometimes some studies have looked at 10 uh, years old as the age limit. Um, so older than 10, then they would say they won't have decent uh, uh, implantation, decent outcome. So maybe do not, perform cochlear implantation and think about a cross or a bone conduction device to reroute the sound. If they're implanted, the better candidates are those that are implanted younger than seven, ideally younger than four. Those are the ones that do really well with a single-sided deafness cochlear implantation. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones between four and 10, they're still a candidate for cochlear implantation. They need a lot of rehab. And uh, uh, we just, they, they just have to be, the family have to be counseled properly on them. Anyone want to add anything on that? Okay. Maybe even regarding, you know, Dr. the congenital hearing loss, for example, we have to respect, of course, the uh, the policy of the institutions. For example, the some institutions, they, they offer the cochlear implantation up to four, four years old, for example, three years. But maybe maybe some uh, the, the parents, if, if we have a child, for example, nine years old or 10 years old, prelingual, uh, but, but, but the, the family, sometimes for them, it's okay to, to, to detect that sound for their child. So uh, even, even if no speech discrimination, no speech outcomes, it's okay for them for the speech, uh, for, for the sound detection. I absolutely agree with you. That's why I think, um, we we have a few too many patients like that, and we try to give them as meaning as meaningful sound as possible. But sound itself is is a gift, is a blessing. So uh, it helps you not being isolated. Be help you. It, some of them is just a safety situation, um, and being able to know where the sound is coming from. So I, I think um, we. I don't think although the cochlear implant have been here for decades, um, we don't know the limits for two reasons. First of all. The more we know about the, the, the diagnosis, in the past, we didn't have auditory neuropathy, which all, all sense neural hearing loss. Now we, we we're subdividing them. There are genetic um, mutations. There are things that will help us counsel. That's why people say, well, okay, so um, all children older than five or six or seven don't do well with cochlear implantation. That's not true because we have not yet reached to the nitty gritty microdiagnosis for each child. And we still, the cochlear implant cochlear implants themselves are being developed and we have better technologies as we do, as we live and hopefully we'll have better technologies uh, to improve our, the care of children. Um, uh, then uh, the next question we have, how frequently we should follow up with a child after implant procedure? So basically I think this, this, uh, this uh, attendee is asking, how frequently would you follow up a child after cochlear implantation? Uh, Dr. Mohammed, maybe take this answer. Uh, follow up as as uh, as I mentioned, the long term uh, of course long term follow up. Once he's stable on 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 the hearing, for example, here she, the normal hearing, no no any uh, comments for, from the speech therapist. So I follow them uh, uh, every six months. Uh, Dr. Sal, do you have anything to add for this? You're good. Okay. Uh, what are trends that have taken place in recent years in regards to cochlear implantation? Um, I think um, from a surgical perspective, what we have is uh, there are more, we know now that uh, bilateral uh, implantation, uh, the child uh, having sound appreciation, sound input from both ears is better than one. So they were, we're doing more and more bilateral simultaneous cochlear implantation uh, at a younger age. Uh, that's 
one of the uh, advancements. The other advancement that we're talking about, there are things pertaining to the sound processors. And every few years, there are new technologies in terms of sound processors. There are some uh, controversial advancement when it comes to the type of electrodes and type of devices that is being planted for different type of cochleas um, and uh, measuring the cochlear duct length and what have you. These are very controversial, still being studied uh, to see how much of it is uh, applicable to uh, that actually have produced uh, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. But the, one of the things that we, I think, practice in our institution is that we've we started doing less and less uh, CT scans prior, prior to uh, cochlear implantation. Uh, and we're really uh, managing to for, to go with MRIs unless it's, there is some specific thing we need to see in a CT scan, which reduced the need for MRI in our institution, I think by 80%. Uh, so I think that's good because we're reducing the radiation on children. Um, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Asar, anything you want to add on this? Maybe uh, also the anatomy-based fitting also. Uh, and and how to predict the magnet strength based on the CT scan for the patient. Uh, okay, so what are the risks associated with cochlear implant for use of cochlear implants? Uh, Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Asara, do you want to talk about this? I think Dr. Muhammad uh, could uh, shed more light. Okay, yeah. Dr. Muhammad. I think I think that I, I don't know if with, I don't understand the question well, but I think what they yeah. mean is there an associated risk with long term use of cochlear implantation. I think is that there, is the question. Uh, yeah. Meningitis, maybe. Yeah. If uh, yeah, we we should uh, consider that. So we need to make sure that the child is vaccinated. So that that's one thing that we should uh, consider. Yeah, even you know the the cochlear implant complication nowadays. Around uh, maybe three to seven percent, the major complications maybe one to two three percent maybe, and and the minor complications also because you know the wound nowadays is smaller, and uh, I think we have a good surgeons well trained, uh, and it's more familiar. Um, I think uh, one of the things that some parents ask about is that, well, will the cochlear implant cause problems in the ear long-term? And I think from all the studies we've had, and most of the studies have looked at 20 to 30 years of, uh, of implantation, uh, and thankfully, uh, the complications that we have are not common. Uh, I won't talk about device-related issues. Uh, if you talk about from a surgical perspective, uh, the long-term complications that may happen, there's a small chance as any ear surgery, you have to develop cholecystoma, uh, which is a, uh, a growth inside the ear that uh, produces chemicals and whatnot, causes erosion and infections in the ear. There's a small chance of developing that, but that applies to any ear surgery. Um, and um, there is a small chance as well of causing a tympanic membrane perforation, uh, but that will be acute. That will be something usually usually something that you notice right away. As Dr. Sara mentioned and Muhammad, uh, you have to always keep an eye on uh, of any infection that happened with the ear. So you always tell the parents if there is a trauma in the head or if there is an ear pain or fever that is unexplained, right away come and see us because we want to make sure there's no acute test needed that can't end up developing into a mastoiditis or a, um, a, um, a meningitis. Okay, so we're getting through Next, um, can adenoid hypertrophy affect the hearing and speech, uh, Dr. Asara? Well, if, if we're talking about um, indirectly uh, thinking about adenitis media with effusion, then this could be an, an indirect cause, but we shouldn't rely uh, the, the, uh, the speech delay absolutely on the adenoid hypertrophy, but it's certainly uh, something to consider. Uh, so, like I said, um, uh, it's very important to know uh, uh, if, if the child has adenoid hypertrophy, they have a higher chance of having titus media with effusion, especially if it was an earlier age, uh, and if it was um, uh, consistent, it, it, uh, it's taking a long time uh, and no intervention has been done. 
um, it's not resolved. Uh, so yes, it, it could lead to speech delay if it's associated with other factors such as loss of stimulation at home and other than that. So yeah, you just need to look at the child as a whole and make sure that they are uh, managed. Uh, you shouldn't keep the child with a problem like that without uh, you know, um, very good follow-up like watchful waiting or whatever uh, procedure you want to go ahead and do for the child. Uh, the other thing I would mention from speech perspective, yes, it's not hearing, is that if they have adenoid hypertrophy, if it's large enough, it may be causing something we call hyponasal speech, where the air passage is passing through the mouth, mostly not through the nose. So you get a lot of uh, mispronunciation of the vowels and, and consonants. And uh, it, it sounds like someone who has a permanent cold. And that can affect uh, the child pronunciation, and it may result in... Uh, in 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 uh, in uh, bullying at school and whatnot, as well as you know uh, progress at school. So this is another thing which is not really our topic today, but just to mention. Okay, do you think in increase in autism is related to hearing loss in children? So basically, are, they're asking if are we? Uh, okay, I'll let Sarah let Sarah to answer it. Do you think here autism is related to hearing loss in a, an increase in diagnosis of autism is related to hearing loss in children? Uh, yeah, well, we, we, we need to, like I said, we need to consider uh, behavioral issues and neurodivergent diseases uh, such as autism in, in children where, when we're assessing uh, speech delay. Um, uh, autistic children could have um, hyperacusis and sometimes periocanal dehiscence, which is basically hearing, conductive hearing loss. Uh, so we need to consider that. Uh, and th this could be also related to sensor neural hearing loss if it, maybe it, it's correlated uh, incidentally, but we need to work with these patients together with the uh, psychiatry or the psychology to make sure that the child uh, goes through the right path uh, and to start, for example, speech therapy, but we need to make sure that they have uh, th their, their hearing assessment was complete and done uh, before progressing for uh, speech therapy. Great. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we're almost done, guys. Good good job. So all patients need hearing. Do, so do, the question is, do all patients need hearing aids before proceeding with cochlear implantation? Dr. Mohammed? You know, of course, we'll, we have to, to start with the non-surgical option. At least for three to six months, if no, no, no improvement with with, with the hearing aids, so we, we will move to the cochlear implantation. Except, for example, if we have a case with for uh, emergency cochlear implantation, like a meningitis, for example, we'll go for the implantation. Great. And our last question, and then we'll do a bit of wrap up. Uh, if the child is unvaccinated, should we delay the cochlear implant until we get a vac uh, get get the child vaccinated? Yeah, anyone? Just just uh, Dr. Hamad, maybe, and then Dr. Sarah. Delay the vac uh, the vaccination uh, the the surgery because the percent of meningitis for the unvaccinated maybe one to two percent. So I'm not going to delay. Dr. Sarah, anything to add for this? Um, it, so, it should be very easy to get the vaccine, I think. So uh, I'm not sure if it would be a very big issue. Uh, I mean, uh, all, all, all children get their vaccines and uh, proceed with the cochlear implants. That's what I, uh, I'm seeing in the practice. I, I think I think the, um, the, uh, the, the question may be, and maybe we can answer even if it's not the that was the question. I think the question was um, maybe they meant. I mean, if the child did not get general vaccination, not just meningitis, like if the child is not up to date with their vaccination, would we still proceed with cochlear implantation? I think the answer is yes. We can give them the meningitis vaccine at least, and then proceed with uh, the rest of the uh, uh, our sur our surgery. There are situations where we uh, had to do the surgery for whatever reason and the child did not get the vaccine until post-operatively, yes, that happened. But most of the time, almost 
all the time the child gets the vaccination at least two weeks prior to the cochlear implantation. We managed to plan it that way and it works out really well. Um, so, um, the, so just to conclude, what we've learned today is that it's important for us to um, early detect and early intervene in children with suspected hearing loss. Um, we want to encourage the parents, we want to come to us. We want to create a safe place for the parents not to feel judged because one of the issues that parents have is sometimes they feel that they screwed up, that they did not um, help their child. Is that their fault? I think the first thing patient family want to get reassured that they did not screw up, that they're coming late because most of them sometimes did not even have newborn hearing screen. It's not their fault uh, or they had it. It wasn't communicated to them well. So I think that's very important. So be patient with your patients. Uh, listen to them and uh, and learn that it's a journey. The, those patients are yours for life. They're going to continue to see you. You Once you have diagnosed their hearing loss and started treatment with them, usually those patients stick with you because they are now emotionally invested with you and you are emotionally invested with them. And uh, and they know how to reach you, and you you have to have an open line with them to be able to, to for them to reach you as as fast as possible. So to some to wrap up, we as I mentioned before, we have the MESPO conference uh, in October. It will be held uh, on between 17 and 19 of October in Jeddah. We've opened uh, the abstract submission, and if you wanted to submit your abstract, you can visit our website at mespo.net. You can go to abstract, and you find three categories. You have the general submission for most abstracts, short video submission and competition submission, and just a bit of the competition submission. It is directed for uh, trainees, students, uh, and interns, um, who are in the field that, that in the field of training for clinical practice for something that deals with ear, nose, and throat disorder in children? So please submit your work, and we're happy to go through it and hopefully feature it in our program. Uh, and um, any last words, Dr. Mohammed? Thank you so much. Thanks uh, for inviting us in, in this amazing webinar, and thanks for the audience also. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Wonderful information. Dr. Asar, any, any last comments or pearls? Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Faisal, for this opportunity. And uh, I agree with you. Uh, listen to the parents. Do not disregard any uh, concern very quickly as non significant. Um, and um, thank you for the audience. The questions were great. Uh, and hopefully we can do this again and see you, inshallah, in uh, the uh, second uh, MESPO conference. All right. Thank you all for coming. It's been almost an, it's an hour and 40 minute webinar, so it's yeah. much longer than expected. Yeah. But we did good. We muscled through it. And thank you guys for attending. And thank you for the attendees. And thank you also for Event Troop for organizing this. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.